A lot of people ask why we have Eco, why we would get the U2 stage here. It's a recycled art sculpture and it really gives you a sense of awe. When you have that moment of awe and magic, your heart is more open to possibilities. There's a future plan for a virtual reality experience underneath Eco. This is a craft or a, a ship that can take you on an adventure to learn about science. The first time that I saw it was at a, a concert in Spain. It was really a, a, a fascinating experience that a structure could have such an interplay with 100,000 people. After the tour was over, uh, the band U2 wanted to do something creative with the stage, something that was good for the planet and good for the world. The Living Planet came up and decided that they would like to work on refurbishing the structure and making it a part of their exhibit. It took eight years from the time I saw it till the time we got a confirmation that, okay, let's see if we can make this work. I figured out how to find a rendering of it to see if it would actually fit. And it fit perfectly and it matched the aesthetic of, of the concepts we were doing for the future building. It matched where we wanted to go. I didn't have to move anything on the site that we already had. And so from that moment, we were kind of like, no, this is, this is it. This thing belongs. This is going to be great. The next stage after that was to find out, is it feasible from an engineering standpoint to take the structure that was meant for temporary use? Was it possible to make that a permanent structure in Salt Lake City with a couple of caveats? There's earthquake zone four, so there's a lot of engineering that needs to be done and checked for that. And then of course there's snow, so can the structure hold up the snow load that would inevitably be on it? Nobody's ever done this before. None of, none of my team had done this before. And for them to say, yeah, we'll figure it out. They just could see the potential. The facilities team was responsible for taking it all off the truck when it arrived and the inventory. But they also were responsible for trying to put it together loosely to see what it would look like. The claw in total had over a thousand pieces. It was 15, 20 truckloads. And truckloads being, you know, flatbed 18 wheelers. It started in October, 2018 and went right through, I think, until the spring of 2019. There were giant pieces, 25, 30 feet long, and then some that were maybe two or three feet long. Everything had to be x-rayed, and anything that was not perfect had to be re-welded or a new piece put on, replaced. The entire fabric structure was long gone. All of the wiring and lighting and electronics were also long gone, not available. It's super important that everything is checked, double checked, engineered, soil samples are taken, missing parts are replaced. Buildings you don't lift up in the air, <laughs> put, put the floors in one by one until you get to floor one. It's the opposite. And that's the way this one is designed. There was a lot of risk in doing this lift. So in, in every other situation, you always want to build your base and you want to build your tower and then you want to build up from there, much like a building, much like anything else. This is different in the sense that what we're doing here is hanging a structure as opposed to building a structure. It's, it's more of an experiment in an arch than it is building a tower. Before the lift day, uh, there was lots and lots of meetings, both with people in person, but also on the phone to, to walk through every single thing that needed to happen, where the cranes were gonna be set up, what we were gonna do with wind. So all of that was determined using tabletop meetings. Um, it took years of planning. Obviously we've been working for months and months, actually a couple years, just to get it to this stage. Because we have a construction team, we have a field work team, we have our internal team, we have consultants coming in. I think to expect the unexpected is the best thing to be ready for. Yeah, guys, I spent uh, three years on tour with this stage, with uh, working for the company that created it. Um, I built it uh, over three years with three different teams um, in any number of situations all over the world. Um, she's, a, she's a beautiful thing, but she's, uh, she's big. What we're hoping to do is to get up in six hours and then spend two hours welding at each corner um, to affix it to the ground and then be able to let the cranes go. As soon as we're done doing that, we're going to uh, put the leg skins on and then that'll be the day. Um, so, guys, uh, be safe out there. Watch out for each other, yeah? All right.
If we had any gusts over five miles per hour, the lift was off. So it's like putting on a show, right? Again, it's all choreographed. You have people that are in charge of the lift, people in charge of talking to the people who are in charge of the lift, people who are in charge of making sure the ground and all the equipment is safe, people that are in charge of making sure that everyone has the radios and communication, everyone can hear everything. Who is the point person for what piece? Who can make decisions and who can't? You've got this critical window where you have to either stop right then and there or not start in the first place or once you're to a certain point you have to go you cannot stop because you can't leave 200 tons dangling overnight way too risky the last phase is the it's called the pylon that pylon itself is suspended from eight cables. In a high wind situation, that free hanging pylon can start to oscillate. And if that starts oscillating, then the whole structure can start oscillating. We realized that some of the cables were the wrong sizes. And what did we do? We actually had to remake the cables. We piled the old cables in a truck, the truck went off to the shop, and we remade cables so that we could bring them back and put up the pylon. So the first windstorm, I was probably out there for hours just looking for movement and trying to see if anything was happening. Um, but fortunately, it was good. In the midst of all this, we get hit with uh, COVID and shut down. And so we had to quickly figure out how can we utilize this space? The good news is it allowed us so much more space to have people come into the aquarium, come into the, the Rio Tinto Plaza, and be socially distant. And one of the things that came out of that was our Nights Under Lights, where we can have multiple nighttime parties and many people can experience eco in a safe way. I'm really excited to see this go back up and to see it be a part of something as visionary as what the Living Planet is trying to do. I think it's great because it shows what humans can achieve. It, it's, it's this great representation of, of what science and engineering can do. It's truly beautiful. When the lights are on and you're underneath it, it's just magical. One thing I've found with art is that when you can touch people and you can get that emotional connection with them, they feel that sense of inspiration. They're more open to learning. They're more open to, to changing their worldview. Eco really is the start uh, of something bigger. It's almost like an art piece that's never going to be finished. There's always one more thing to do on it. But that's also part of the excitement is that it's, it doesn't have to be done and over. It can always be growing and changing.